Welcome to day two of Back Garden Bushcraft with Ellis Brigham and Fjall Raven. And today we're going to cover fire lighting. Yesterday we talked about building shelter. So hopefully you've now got a shelter protecting you from this sort of pretty wet weather. And now we're going to really make that shelter home by learning how to make a fire. Fires are vitally important and Looking back through our history as a species, it's fire that separated us from the rest of the animal kingdom. We learned how to light fires, and once we learned how to light fires, we were able to use it to cook food, to make it taste better, to make tools, and to protect ourselves against wild animals, and to keep warm on really cold nights. So, having the skill to light a fire connects you with our ancestors, but also can make the wilderness or even your back garden homely and safe and warm. Because at the moment, it doesn't really feel like that. So fire is really important and a really useful tool, but it can also be very dangerous and cause a lot of damage. So before we start lighting fires, we need to check a couple of things. First off, we need to have permission to light a fire where we want to. We can't just go into a local park and start lighting fires because we'll get in trouble. So I've got permission, this is our back garden, so I give myself permission to light a fire here. So that's number one tick. Number two, we want to make sure that the fire can't get out of control and cause any damage. We're using a fire dish which is perfect because the fire can't spread out of that and it's not going to cause any damage to the ground. If you haven't got one of these and you've got a bit of grass, what you can do is dig up the grass, leave the top bit of grass off to the side somewhere, burn your fire in the hole that you've created and then when you've finished you can put the grass back over the top and it will hide the fact that you've ever had a fire there, which is what we want to try and achieve. We also want to make sure that the fire can't catch anything else alight. So I wouldn't want to build it next to a wooden fence or a wooden shed, because if that was to catch fire, we'd be in a lot of trouble as well. So making sure we've got permission and that it can't spread and that there's nothing flammable nearby. Those three things are really important. So once we've got permission and we know that it's safe and not going to spread anywhere and catch anything else alight, we want to always make sure that we've got an adult present with us when the fire is alight. And anything in the fire or near the fire, we have to assume is going to be really hot. So we don't want to go in and start grabbing things because we're likely to burn ourselves. So that's the safety out the way. But once the fire is alight, we still have to make sure that safety is always the first thing we think about. Right, lighting a fire then. It's really exciting and it's a really good skill. However, the problem with fire lighting is that the more you need it, the harder it is to light. If it's a really nice dry sunny day and all your fuel is nice and dry, it's easy to light a fire, but you're warm and you probably don't need it. But if it's weather like this and it's wet and cold, you really need a fire to stay warm, but everything's wet and it's much harder to light. So that's when good fire skills really pay off. I don't want this to sound too much like a school lesson, but there are some things that we need to bear in mind when we're lighting a fire. So, I'm sure lots of you will have seen this before, and this is what we call the fire triangle. If it's new to you, it's really simple. We need three ingredients to make a fire. It's a bit like making a cake. You put in eggs, flour and butter and then those are the ingredients to make your cake. For fire we need fuel, heat and oxygen. 
Now, the fuel we'll be burning is wood. The heat source, we can use a lighter, we can use some matches, we can use a, a fire steel that creates hot sparks. And the oxygen, well, that's all around us, so we can't really do too much about that at the moment. But we can sometimes blow on a fire and that puts more oxygen into it. So, once you've understood that basic thing, there's one more thing we need to think about. We've got our ingredients. This is my fuel. This is my heat source. And we've got oxygen all around us, as we've said. So, in theory, this should light but it's not going to. And it's not going to light because my fuel source is too big or my heat source is too small. If I had a flamethrower, then that would probably burn. But unfortunately, I, I haven't got a flamethrower and they're quite dangerous. So we need to make our fuel much smaller. If I take some dead twigs, which I collected yesterday, Again, they're made of wood, so the fuel is the same, the heat source is the same, but the key thing is the fuel is much smaller. Now, this is a good example that too much oxygen can also put a fire out because the wind is blowing my lighter out a little bit. So, now that my heat source and my fuel are in a better proportion, that's going to start to burn like that. So it's just like making a cake. If I put the ingredients in, it's eggs, flour and butter. But if I put 100 eggs and a teaspoon of flour and a ton of butter, all the ingredients are there, but it wouldn't be a very nice cake. It's exactly the same with fire. We need those three ingredients, but they need to be in the right proportions. If you're ever struggling to light a fire, have a look and make sure that the size of your heat source is in relation to the size of the fuel. So now that we understand the fire triangle, we need to look at our fuel. And it comes in like four main stages. The first stage is tinder, and that's the finest, smallest fuel. Today we're going to use cotton wool with a little bit of Vaseline in it. But if you're out in the wild, you could use dry grass, birch bark, birds nests that aren't used anymore, anything that's dry and fluffy. So that's our tinder. The next stage is our kindling. And that's going to be a big bundle of small sticks. Not much thicker than a pencil. And the key for this is that when I'm collecting them, I try and snap like that. And you see how they break nice and cleanly. That tells me that they're dead. I also found them hanging up in trees. I didn't find them off the ground where they can be really wet. So they're off the ground, they're nice and dry, and when I snap them, they snap really quickly and cleanly. And a friend once told me that if it makes a sound like a crackling fire, then it's gonna burn well. The next stage, once these are burning, is to put on sticks about finger to thumb thick. And I always use body measurements because I'm not gonna carry a tape measure out with me in the wild. So I can just use, I've always hopefully got my fingers and thumbs with me. So I can just use those and say, right, that's about finger thick. That's gonna be the next stage. And again, it snaps nice and cleanly. So I want a nice big bundle of those as well. Once those are burning, then we go on to our main fuel. So that's our last stage, really. And that can be anything about wrist thick and bigger. 
if I was building a massive fire, I could put whole tree trunks on there. But we want to keep our fires nice and small because they're much easier to manage, they're much safer, and they use a lot less firewood. If I was to build a bonfire in the back garden here, I think the fire brigade would be over pretty quickly. It's really important that you prepare properly to make a fire. If I rush into this and I get a fire going and I have to run off and get some more fuel, by the time I come back, my fire might be out. So preparation, preparation, preparation. That's key to successful fire lighting, especially when the weather's a bit grim like it is at the moment. So I've got everything ready to go next to me and I'm going to light my fire here. So let's get going. Okay, this is the exciting bit. This is where we get ready to light our fire. The first thing we want to do is take some of our sticks that are about finger or thumb thick and put them down on the ground. This does a couple of things, actually three things. The first thing it does, which is really important, is it protects the fire from the cold, potentially wet ground early on. The second thing it does is allow more oxygen, which we know is one of our key ingredients for lighting fires. It allows more oxygen to travel in underneath and the fire is going to burn hotter. And because these sticks are nice and dead, and we know they're dead because they snap nicely, these will eventually start to burn as well. And when they burn, it will give the fire a really strong heart, so it's less likely to go out. So dead stick platform is always useful. Sometimes I do this in the snow, and in order to stop the fire disappearing down through the snow, we have to build a dead stick platform like a foot thick so that it doesn't burn and disappear. Once we've got that sorted, we get our bundle of twigs, the thinnest ones we have, and we kind of pull it apart like so, so we have two bundles. When I collected these, I made sure that they're about as long as my arm. It's really easy to get into the habit of just breaking all the twigs much smaller. But the problem with that is when you come to put tiny little twigs on the fire, your fingers have to get really close to the flames and the flames are really hot, so you'll burn yourself. But by keeping the twigs really long, I can burn them and still move them without burning myself because I'm not fuel. The wood should be burning, not me. So now I can take these two bundles and control them really easily. So our first stage, can you remember what it was called? Tinder, that's right. Okay, so we take our tinder, which is our finest material. In this case, it's cotton wool, but you could use newspaper scrunched up. You could use birch bark. There's lots of things you could use. We're using this because it's the easiest and it's what we had in the bathroom upstairs. So I'm going to take that, I'm going to put it on my dead stick platform and then I'm going to take my fuel source. I could use a lighter like so or I could use a fire steel so this creates a big shower of hot sparks and then that's going to set that alight and then my two bundles are ready right next to me so I don't have to run off and gather them. They're right here and I can put them straight on. Okay, so let's go. I'm going to use the fire steel because this is my favourite method. Sometimes it takes a little while to get the sparks where we want them. But there we go. Now that's starting to burn. I'm not rushing because I've got plenty of time. I take one bundle of twigs and I place them over the top. Now I haven't let go of them and because they're nice and long I'm not burning myself and I don't want to squash the flame because it's going to extinguish it, it's going to cut out all the oxygen. 
and we know that oxygen's a key part, a key ingredient for the fire. So I can still control it. I need to make sure that the flame is touching the fuel, otherwise it'll never catch fire. And also there's enough oxygen in there. In a minute, this will start to crackle, like your cereal in the morning, snap, crackle and pop. And once that starts happening, then I'm gonna put the next bundle on over the top. So we can see the flames are just starting to come through there now. So I can take my next bundle and I can place it over the top there. Sometimes you just have to be a bit patient with fire and let it do its thing. As long as it's got all the ingredients, it will burn. Now where I positioned the second bundle of twigs was really important. I put it straight over where the flame is and in a nice tight bundle, because if it's really spread out, it's not gonna burn that well. And I lay in what we call a V, all the sticks on top. So they're all directly over that central bit of flame there. Now I can see the flames are growing. There's a bit of smoke, which we'll talk about in a minute, but the flames are growing. I can now put my finger thick and thumb thick sticks over the top. And again, I like to keep these nice and long because it's just easier to handle. Can you hear that popping? That's a really good sign. It tells me I've got a happy fire. If there was lots of smoke and not very much flame, I'd be a bit worried. It wouldn't be very healthy. At this stage, the fire is really hungry. So it's important to feed it and give it lots of fuel. But I'm not just taking the whole basket of fuel and dumping it on top. I'm taking a little bit at a time and placing it on top of the fuel I've already put down. So that's burning really well now. If I was to put some more fuel on it, I'd want to put it on in that V pattern. So always adding fuel in that way. And that's a really good way to grow a fire. You might notice when you put more fuel on that you get a lot more smoke because the fire is just sort of struggling to start burning that new wood. It's not a problem, but if you wanted to add more oxygen, which is what the fire needs, you could get a baking tray or a frisbee or a, a paper plate and fan it. And that puts lots of oxygen into it. That's a really safe way to do things. I haven't always got that with me when I'm on my trips, so I just get used to blowing into the fire. But it's really important that you don't get too close because the fire can get too close to your face and you can lose your eyebrows and look a little bit silly. So take a nice big breath. And imagine you're blowing out candles on a birthday cake. It's a nice, long, steady blow. And then I lean back, taking a nice clean breath of air and blow again. That's burning really nicely now. It's really nice and warm. And even though it's still a bit cold and wet, I feel quite snug and warm in my shelter. I've got the roof above me. I'm not getting wet from the rain and the fire's giving me lots of warmth. So it's feeling really homely. Of course, it wouldn't be a campfire without some marshmallows. And uh, I think no matter how old you are, roasting marshmallows over a fire is still a pretty amazing thing to do. So I've just got a stick here 
Um, you could use a skewer from your kitchen. Um, you just need to make sure that it's not a stick that's from a tree that's poisonous. So something from the kitchen would be easiest to know it's safe. And I personally like my marshmallows slightly burnt on the outside, gooey in the middle with a chewy center. So my technique is to let them just about catch fire and then blow them out. Sugar gets really hot, so you want to be careful that you don't just put it straight into your mouth. You need to blow on it and let it cool down. And also waving around marshmallows on the end of sticks is really dangerous because they can fly off. And I've seen a couple of accidents where people have ended up with marshmallows on their faces and have got burnt. So be really careful with this. Now that's pretty good, but to make it better, we can make a s'more. And that is a couple of your favorite biscuits or cookies with a melted marshmallow in between. Look at that. Well, there we go. Even though it's still raining, underneath this shelter with the fire burning, it feels really warm, snug and homely. Fire was so important for our ancestors. It meant safety, warmth, good food, and could even scare off predators. I love just sitting and looking into the fire and I think it connects with a really old part of our brain. It might be something we've lost a bit because we live in houses that have got central heating, electricity, and sometimes I think the flickering of a TV replaces the flickering of a fire. So wherever possible, it's always nice to get outside, even if it is just in your back garden. Light a fire, sit around it, cook some marshmallows, Enjoy the warmth, the friendship, and tell some good stories. We would love to see your creations, so please upload using the hashtag BackGardenBushcraft to be in with a chance of winning a Fair Raven goodie bag. And one lucky family at the end of the week will win a whole family of backpacks. Good luck. There we go. So once you've finished with the fire, you need to make sure it's out. The easiest way to do that is to get a watering can or the garden hose or even a saucepan from the kitchen with some water in it. Pour water all over the fire until there's no longer any flame, smoke or heat in there. Once you've done that, you can leave it. Fires that are left when they're still burning can cause a lot of damage. So it's your responsibility if you've started it to make sure that it's out properly.